to me. So let's take it from the top. Two girls leave Shanghai in 1937. Well, sh oh, and here's my reading. Shanghai, 1937 was a glamorous city, a city of great diversity, a city of uh, people who had come there from all over the world. And uh, I'm just going to read this quick little part, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So Pearl and May are two sisters. They are, in this scene, on their way to work. Uh, they are models who work for an artist uh, in Shanghai advertising. And they're riding in a rickshaw, and they're on their way. We cross a bridge over Suchow Creek and then turn right away from the Wangpu River and its dank odors, dank odors of, oh, this, is like, this is why I don't read. Like, <laughs> okay, we're gonna start again. We cross a bridge over Suchow Creek and then turn right away from the Wangpu River and its dank odors of oil, seaweed, coal, and sewage. I love Shanghai. It isn't like other places in China. Instead of swallowtail roofs and glazed tiles, we have magical big buildings that reach into the sky. Instead of moon gates, spirit screens, lattice squirk windows, and red lacquer pillars, we have neoclassical edifices in granite decorated with art deco, ironwork, geometrical designs, and etched glass. Instead of bamboo groves gracing streams or willows draping their tendrils into ponds, we have European villas with clean facades, elegant balconies, rows of cypress, and cleanly cut lawns lined with immaculate flower beds. The old Chinese city still has temples and gardens, but the rest of Shanghai kneels before the gods of trade, wealth, industry, and sin. The city has go-downs where goods are loaded and unloaded, courses for greyhound and horse racing, countless movie palaces, and clubs for dancing, drinking, and having sex. Shanghai is home to millionaires and beggars, gangsters and gamblers, patriots and revolutionaries, artists and warlords, and the Chin family. Our puller takes us down alleys just wide enough for pedestrians, rickshaws, and wheelbarrows before turning onto Bubbling Well Road. He trots onto the elegant boulevard, unafraid of the purring Chevrolets and Daimlers that hurtle past. At a stoplight, beggar children shoot into the traffic to surround our rickshaw and pull at our clothes. Each block brings us smells of death and decay, ginger and roast duck, French perfume and incense. The loud voices of native Shanghainese, the steady click-click of the abacus, and the rattle of rickshaws rolling through the streets are the background sounds that tell me that this is home. So, Shanghai, 1937, was the Paris of Asia. It was, as you heard in this place, a, a scene, a city of, of you know, great wealth and extraordinary poverty. People had come from all over the world to be there. You had the French who had settled the French concession. You had white Russians who had escaped out of Russia during the revolution and had sought and found refuge in Shanghai. You had the British who thought that they were running everything, although you could argue that it was actually the Chinese gangsters who were. 1937, you had a big wave of Jews out of Germany who went, you know, got onto these boats and were looking and looking and looking for some place to land, and Shanghai was the only city that would take them, and of course, the Chinese themselves. And this was this final, final moment before things really started to go downhill in Shanghai. In August 1937, the Japanese bombed and really invaded Shanghai. Sino-Japanese War rolled right into World War II. As soon as World War II was over, outbreak of civil war, and then uh, Mao took over the country in 1949. And Mao and the communists took a very dim view of Shanghai. They looked at Shanghai kind of like a, a woman with a really seedy past, a woman who should be punished. And so Shanghai went from being kind of the Paris of Asia to being more along the lines of the Fresno of Asia, not a place you wanted to be. And there, Shanghai really remained until the mid-1980s when it began to have this renaissance and rebirth. And so today, you could say that Shanghai is once again the Paris of Asia. You could say that it's now the New York of Asia. Or perhaps, most accurately, you could say that New York is now the Shanghai of the rest of the world. So in this city are two beautiful girls. 
And by beautiful girls, I mean that they, this was their profession. They were uh, models for this very particular kind of Shanghai advertising that took the shape of these posters and calendars. And these girls would model and, and they were selling all kinds of things, everything from matches to carburetors, from um, cigarettes to champagne, from baby formula to who knows what, just everything. And they were selling this kind of modern Chinese life, a modern Chinese woman. She was not like her mother or her grandmother. She didn't have bound feet. She was well-educated. She expected to marry for love and not go into an arranged marriage. And uh, so these posters have these images, again, of these sort of modern women. So what would they be doing? Playing golf, playing tennis, diving into a pool, climbing out of the pool, getting, stepping off of airplanes, waving, driving cars, smoking cigarettes, drinking champagne, dancing in nightclubs, because again, they were selling this really modern woman who was going to transform China. Now, I've been collecting this poster art for years and years and years. I love it. And next to my bed on the left side, I have my favorite poster is framed. And I see it every night before I go to sleep, every night when I wake up in the morning. And it, it has these two girls. And so one is seated, and she's very pretty. And the other one is kind of leaning over her like this. And they're lovely. You know, they were called beautiful girls for a reason. These lovely, lovely complexions, beautiful hair. In this particular poster, they're wearing Western-style dresses with this kind of geometric pattern. And the whole room is all done in sort of pinks and peaches, and it's absolutely beautiful, except for one thing. Falling down in the poster all around them are all of these dead bugs and insects because what it's an ad for is earth, bug, and insect spray. And so the one who's seated there looking so pretty, she's holding one of those old-fashioned bug squirters. So that's one of the reasons I like these because they do have a certain amount of humor to them. Anyway, just as things are starting to go downhill in Shanghai, things take a real turn for Pearl and May, who suddenly find themselves in arranged marriages on their way to the United States. Now, we had a lot of arranged marriages in my family. Uh, my great uncle, back in 1932, he took the whole family back to China on a business trip. And you know how dads, even today, will say, here's a little money, go buy a souvenir. Well, my great uncle said to his boys, you know, as long as we're here, let's just get all you boys wives. <laughs> and that's what they did. The oldest one was about 25, the youngest one was about 14. And these young women who in China had had servants, once they came to the United States, they really became the servants. They lived very closed in lives, very narrow lives. They literally weren't allowed out. And so there are a couple of them still alive today, you know, 70 years later, having lived almost their entire lives in the United States, and maybe they speak about 10 words of English. And these were my aunties growing up. These were the people that I knew. Okay, so Pearl and May's first stop when they arrive in the United States is Angel Island. Angel Island was the immigration station in the San Francisco Bay. We all know Ellis Island. I think we all do here. You know, we all know this is where all of the immigrants from Europe pass through Europe and Russia, pass through Ellis Island on their way to the United States. And yes, there were moments of humiliation and embarrassment. You had to answer 20 standard questions. You had to go through this physical exam. But overall, we'd have to agree that it was a pretty welcoming place because today, one out of every three Americans can trace being in the United States to an ancestor who passed through Ellis Island. 